This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Um, this is the fourth in a seminar series that we conduct with the Institute of English Studies. I'm from the Stephen Spender Trust. My name is Rabina Thurnberg. Um, I'm very grateful to Lara Feidel for organising this and chairing it. We've got Elaine Fortfuck, Elaine Morley, Lara Feidel, Matthew Spender. Um, the next seminar is in May. It's on life writing with Max Saunders and with Sarah Blackwell and Wendy Muffet. And we'll be public publicity about that on the Institute of English Studies website and on ours. Um, there are drinks afterwards to which you're very welcome. I hope you'll stay. That's at about 7.30. And I think that's it, really. I think you should start. Thank you very much, Rabina, and thank you for coming. Um, so I am Lara Feigl, and I'm from King's College of London, and edited the journal of the Student Centre with John Sullivan. This is Elaine Morley, who is a lecturer in the German department at Queen Mary and is the author of a recently published book, Iris Murdoch and Elias Canetti, Intellectual Allies, um, and Convenience, an Anglo-German MA. Um, Matthew Spender is the poet's son um, and is in his own right a very well-known sculptor and is currently writing a memoir uh, biography about his father, um, including his time in Germany, which we're going to focus on today. Um, so the format is going to be that we're going to look at a few photos. Um, we are going to talk for about 10 minutes each about different aspects of European witness and spend his time in Germany. And then three of us will have a bit of a discussion and then we'll open up to questions from the floor. Um, so we're just going to start... It seems like every seminar I give on Sunday involves a, a photograph from almost naked, but they would do at least get trousers. Um, so here we have Spender in Germany with Natasha. Um, do you know where they are? No. no. This is uh, the, his driver. Uh, part of the drama of going around Germany was uh, uh, trying to get a car out of the carpool, and the car that they got kept on breaking down, so this had the adv advantage that they meet people that he wouldn't otherwise meet because the car happened to be close to them when they broke down. Including his own wife? Including his own wife, yes. Um, but this is the driver's girlfriend, and uh, Spender was extremely interested to see if there was any sex going on, but there wasn't, which surprised him a great deal. This is a fantastic photograph mm -hmm. of her uh, obviously doing the best she can and not very happy in, in the situation six months after the end of the war. This is a man called uh, Auerbach, in his, his real name is Auerbach, who was Aulach in a European Witness. He appears twice in the European Witness, um, and both times he's increasingly insane. He thinks that the Nazis are devils, and incompetent devils at that, because um, true devils are loyal to each other, whereas at the end of the Nazi regime they were disloyal to each other. Devils are people who are totally egotistical, say they're only interested in their own uh, power and inflicted on everybody else without any sense of conscience. This is the black market, I think, in Cologne, I'm not quite sure, with the Russian soldiers and mixing with, um, with uh, old soldiers from the Wehrmacht. This is Kurtzius, um, who Malayne will be talking about later on, taken. And this is... Um, Ernst Junger. Ernst Junger, um, who's an extremely important writer, um, was met by, because the car happened to break down about 15 minutes from his house. Uh, Spender only just discovered who Ernst Junger was. He discovered a, a copy of um, Blut und Stahl, or whatever it's called, um, in the officer's mess, where he happened to be billeted and read it and was extremely shocked. Um, and this is uh, Otto von Bismarck, who um, a spender met through um, Junger. Junger happened to be entertaining uh, Bismarck when, when um, Spender walked and knocked on his door to say hello. Uh, um, and Otto von Bismarck, apart from, apart from being the grandson of the real other chancellor, um, was trying to organize uh, <coughs> teachers in uh, Hamburg 
and um, spend a later winter to have a talk with them. And the talk was quite interesting because it, it involves German nationalism and the Renaissance in Germany after the Second World War. Okay. Oops. That's the famous car which kept on going <coughs> down. And this is an um, officer. Um, Spender had tremendous respect for the officers in charge of, them, of the army, but um, he wasn't of the army. He wasn't there as a member of the, of the, of the British Army. He was there in rather, in rather special circumstances, which I'll explain later. This is my mother, uh, Mrs. Spender, in um, <coughs> Hitler's chancery uh, built by Speer. Um, it's, uh, and this is a, a bombed out photograph of Cologne. These are the displaced persons who came across. There were 9 million DPs in Germany at that time, causing a huge amount of difficulties. And this is the, the spire of Cologne Cathedral photograph by Spender when he caught up the city. The same city seen from a little bit further away. So I think let's leave that there. Um, and I am going to briefly introduce the passage where Spender talks about going to Cologne. Um, so I wanted to read it, a sort of fairly lengthy passage, and just to introduce it, um, because I think this is one of the best things um, he wrote. I think European witness Matthew and I have both been rereading it in the last few days and, and agreed. What a very well written book it is throughout, with sort of so many startling images, um, and very underrated, I think, um, within um, within work on, on Germany and, and on Spender. And, and um, so I just wanted to give you a little indication of, of the kind of thing he's writing. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the way that Spender and other writers attempting to describe the ruined court cities in Germany seem to enter a kind of metaphorical hall of mirrors. I think Spender um, was very much among them. The physical wasteland, the deserts and the, de the nightmares in the deserts, and the destroyed or eerily surviving churches seem to provide a, me a metaphorical, physical equivalent for the spiritual horror. But at the same time, the human suffering could itself act as a metaphor for the destroyed cork city, so it was going in both directions. Um, and in this respect, I think any British writer engaging with ruin was engaging at some level with T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, and Kurtzius, of course, who Elaine is going to talk about, had translated uh, The Wasteland before the war. The ravaged city seemed to call for the stark figurative language of Eliot's poem, with the landscape of the German wastelands imposing the kind of metaphoricity, Matthew and I have been complaining about academic words, metaphoricity is one of them, that Eliot evokes in his land laid waste. For Eliot, the metaphorical stony rubbish exists in a landscape where religion has been exiled. What are the roots that clutch, he asks, what branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images, where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter. And it's just, I think, this sense that the spiritual cannot exist in, the, in this desert of broken fragments and dead trees, that the stony rubbish must be a physical manifestation of the spiritual desolation of Europe, that characterises the post-war accounts of Germany. Um, and I think it's for this reason that the cathedrals which remained intact in so many of the court cities provoked so much attention from Spender and from other com commentators as they tried to negotiate a path between pity and blame and guilt and suffering. Um, it was always the first thing that people noticed when they visited Cologne and other cities. Um, the towering building had survived an extraordinary 262 raids with its outline virtually intact. Um, the British bombers had been instructed to use the cathedral as navigational aids uh, in locating their targets, but also to avoid them where possible. And they seem to have actually obeyed these orders, um, which given the, sort of the lack of accuracy of, of, of the bombing, which generally seems, seems remarkable. Um, the fact that the cathedral is now stood alone without the usual sort of other tall buildings that would, that would have been beside them gave them a kind of exaggerated hugeness and Cologne Cathedral was even more significant because after it was finally completed in the late 19th century, it functioned not just as a place of worship, but as a national monument, triumphantly celebrating the newly founded German Empire. Following the First World War, the cathedral transmuted into a symbol of German resistance to the French occupation of the Rhineland and became an important monument in the new strong Germany of the 1930s. Um, so for, for, for lots of people visiting it, the Third Reich's failure to um, the, Third, the Third Reich's misplaced pride before its fall 
was highlighted by the cathedral's failure to fall. Um, and to many German commentators, the church was an ambivalent symbol, as terrible as it was beautiful. Although it was still standing, its destruction, it, in its desolation, it implied the absence of God, like the empty, windowless chapel in Eliot's poem, where the wind is the only sign of life. So before reading the slender passage, I just wanted to compare it to another uh, description of the cathedral by the German writer Peter de Mendelssohn, um, who returned to Germany from British exile in 1945. And he was obsessed with Cologne Cathedral um, and acutely alive to its significance as a shifting symbol. <coughs> His own newspaper, Die Welt, which he founded in Germany, he was in charge of, of newspapers in the British zone, ran a lengthy article on the Cologne Cathedral in 1946 headed the cathedral in the rubble ground. Is the cathedral standing, begins the article, going on to wonder how often the question was asked during the war, when Cologne weathered a hail of bombs. The journalist reports the shock and relief that greeted the inhabitants of Cologne as they returned to their home after miserable years away. Relief because the cathedral was still there. Shock because it protruded, lonely in the middle of a dreary expanse of rubble, no longer flanked by the other buildings, which together formed that unique, finely tuned panorama the city. And it's this lonely protrusion, the arrogant survival in the face of surrounding ruin, that fascinated de Mendelssohn. In his 1981 epilogue to his unfinished novel, Die Cathedrale, began in 1948, he states that the novel was written under the still living impression of the destroyed German towns, where often miraculously only the Gothic cathedrals were left standing. Cologne seems to have provided a model for the unnamed town in the novel, where the surviving cathedral is a horrific manifestation of the arrogance of its narrator and anti-hero, an architect who turns out to have built the cathedral. So in a pivotal scene in the book, the, the hero faces the towering church, encountering it as an adversary, a kind of mighty opposite, and forces himself to look at it face on, face to face. Why must you survive, he asks, addressing it like God with the informal do, and wondering why this, alone among his sins, has survived. And the mention of sin opens the way for an association of the cathedral with hell. So for Spender, who was less inclined to find in the ruins of Germany symbols of Nazi arrogance, the cathedral in Cologne was a, in Cologne was a more straightforward symbol than it was for de Mendelssohn. Like the German writer, Spender is first struck by the wasteland. It was in Cologne, he says, that I realised what total destruction meant. But he's more sympathetic to the plight of the inhabitants than de Mendelssohn and compares the dead city to London, which he feels is, make, is, is merely wounded by comparison. In England, there are holes, gaps, and wounds, but the surrounding life of the people themselves has filled them up, creating a scar which will heal. In towns such as Cologne and those of the Ruhr, something quite different has happened. The external destruction is so great that it cannot be healed, and the surrounding life of the rest of the country cannot flow into and resuscitate the city which is not only battered, but also dismembered and cut off from the rest of Germany and from Europe. Spender wrote this report, of course, for a British public that he felt wasn't sympathetic enough to the plight of Germany, and we'll talk about him as a kind of mediator later, hoping to make them feel responsible for this destruction, and also to see the dangers of isolating Germany as it had been in the First World War, when Cologne itself had been occupied by the British. It is necessary, he insists in, in another article in 1946, to avoid imposing conditions on Germany, which, although they may seem justified as far as the Germans are concerned, will have the effect of tying the whole of Europe to a backward and impoverished Germany. And more romantic, at the same time as Spender was writing articles reminding the British of the greatness of German literature and its influence on English literature, and these articles were, were then translated into German and published in, in German magazines. Aware of the plight of Cologne's inhabitants, Spender is grateful that the comparatively undamaged cathedral offers a degree of hope and gives Cologne what it still retains of character. One sees that this is and was a great city, it is uplifted by the spire of the cathedral from being a mere heap of rubble and a collection of walls like the towns of the Ruhr. For Spender, the cathedral still has a religious significance. It can be uplifting. And here the cathedral seems to take on some of the significance of St Paul's in London, which had stood tall throughout the war as a kind of reminder that Britain, that Britain, could, Britain could take it. Wren's iconic building surprised everyone by surviving a brutal night of bombing unscathed in 1940, and the Daily Mail's photographer, the photographer's Herbert, Herbert Masson's shot 
of the cathedral standing tall appeared in the, cap in the paper, captioned with a triumphant announcement that the church symbolizes the steadiness of London's stand against the enemy, the firmness of right against wrong. No commentator would go quite as far in their description of Cologne Cathedral, but Spender does seem to find the Cologne spires more symbolic of rightness than of hellish irony. Having described Cologne, Spender goes on to ponder the discouraging effect of the corpse town finding that the destruction is serious in more senses than one. And I'd like to read this passage. Can you just press the arrow forward? Yeah. The effect of these corpse towns is a grave discouragement which influences everyone living and working in Germany, the occupying forces as much as the German. The destruction is serious in more senses than one. It is a climax of deliberate effort, an achievement of our civilization, the most striking result of cooperation between nations in the 20th century. It is the shape created by our century, as the Gothic cathedral is the shape created by the Middle Ages. Everything has stopped here, that fusion of the past within the present, integrated into architecture, which forms the organic life of a city, a life quite distinct from that of the inhabitants, who are, after all, only using a city as a waiting room on their journey through time. That long, gigantic life of a city has been killed. The city is dead, and the inhabitants only haunt the cellars and basements. Without their city, they are rats in the cellars, or bats wheeling around the towers of the cathedral. The citizens go on existing with a base, mechanical kind of life, like that of insects in the crannies of walls, who are too creepy and ignoble to be destroyed when the wall is torn down. The destruction of the city itself, with all its past as well as its present, is like a reproach to the people who go on living there. The sermons in the stones of Germany preach nihilism. So here Spender goes beyond seeing the ruined cathedrals as symbols of spiritual hope and ruin, and sees the ruins themselves as alternative cathedrals in their own right. He compares the inhabitants who haunt the lifeless city to the rats in the cellars, or the bats wheeling around the towers of the cathedral. And the reference to the cathedral seems to refer both to Cologne's literal cathedral, which uplifts, uplifts the town and gives it an identity, and to the ruins, which are metaphorical cathedrals in themselves. This double metaphor is continued in the final sentence, the sermons in the stones of Germany preach nihilism. These sermons, presumably both metaphorical and literal, residing in the stones in the walls of the cathedral as symbol and the cathedral as metaphor, preach a destructive form of counter-religion. The real cathedral might still be uplifting, but the cathedral-like ruins are manifestly devoid of spirituality. The Gothic cathedrals of an earlier age have been transformed by a nihilistic culture into a Europe responsible for its own collaborative destruction. So that's just a quick sense of one of the passages in the book um, and how it fits into uh, a kind of wider context of people talking about Germany. And now we're going to move on to Spender's trip to Germany, and Matthew is going to give us. Um, okay, so Spender spent most of the um, war in the fire service. He wasn't, he didn't immediately join the intelligence services like most of his friends, mainly because he didn't get a degree at Oxford. He wasn't considered eligible. Um, in the fire service, he always told me that he joined the fire service ten minutes after the blitz ended and left the fire service ten minutes before the V1s and V2s started falling on London. So for three years, he didn't fight more than one fire, and he was extremely bored and started a series of debates about, uh, well, uh, what will be the future of England after the war. And he would invite people to come speak, so distinguished people like Julian Huxley, uh, to give an idea of how England should be reframed after the Second World War. And this kind of raised his profile among the fire service, so that towards the end of his career, he went into the PID, the Political Intelligence Department, which is a branch of the Foreign Office. Um, he said always that he didn't do anything of interest inside that office, but um, it was enough to get him sent to uh, Germany after the war. He, he couldn't just simply go uh, 10 minutes after the war ended without having some kind of um, uh, military identity. He was not in the army, uh, therefore he had to have some kind of a, he wore an army uniform but without any insignia. And he had a covering letter 
uh, to justify his presence in, in Germany to all the military people that, uh, uh, that he met. This was actually a personal relationship with someone called Philip Noel Baker. Philip Noel Baker was a Canadian of origin, um, um, very intelligent man who was also a, an organizer, and he was appointed in the landslide victory of Clement Attlee in 1945. He was appointed as Labour's uh, government special envoy to, to Europe. And so there was, although my father had, although Spender had a, a, a specific job to do for the intelligence service, he also had a direct um, connection through Philip Nordberger. And in fact, when he sent his uh, secret report to the Foreign Office, it had a covering letter direct person, uh, di uh, addressed personally to Philip Noel Baker, which makes the whole thing uh, typical of the private arrangement that was possible in the Second World War. So why did he go to um, um, uh, Germany? Well, the primary reason was to contact Ernst Robert Curtius, who was this father figure and um, uh, mentor of everything to do with Germany. Elaine will talk about him later. Um, with whom um, Spender had a, a close, as it were, pers it was his personal contact to the to German culture. Um, uh, he already knew about music and he knew about art, but uh, it was necessary for, for him to have Curtius to provide an entry into the what he calls the Apollonian uh, world of Germany as opposed to the Dionysian world of Germany. Apollonian means the creative, imaginative, um, constructive side of Germany, and the Dionysian is, is the destructive side, um, meaning eventually Adolf Hitler. These things, these two things being constant throughout German history. So it was a little bit trying to find a way back in time uh, to, to find the origins of Hitler in um, German Romanticism, for instance, there are lots of people who've written about the subject that there's an autodestructive aspect to the German Romantic movement, as well as this Apollonian um, um, impetus. Um, but the difficulty was that when uh, Spender finally caught up with Curtius, um, Curtius' answers weren't quite what Spender expected. Uh, Spender expected to to at least begin to tackle the question of German guilt for guilt and responsibility. What he was interested in uh, was eventually reconstruction, but for the reconstruction to take place, there had to be an, an act of redemption on the part of Germany. And Spender uh, concentrated on the figure, this one unique figure, chosen because it was so important to him at a personal level. It was uh, of from Curtius that Spender desperately needed something which could um, take things down to a bottom, to bottom level, accept responsibility and start again from scratch. In the back of his mind, in fact, he was thinking of starting a European um, magazine, um, trilingual, uh, using French contributions and German contributions and English contributions. He wrote at a certain point a program subsequently after having filed his report to the P uh, political intelligence department. He, he started writing out ideas of what this, um, this magazine should do um, in, in helping to recreate uh, a European sense of identity. So in many ways he was already in, in um, potential contrast with the thinking of um, the British government. Uh, the British government actually had made very few contingency plans on what to do with Germany after, after the winning of the war. So there was no plan for the reconstruction and there was no, um, there was certainly no uh, uh, concept of, of um, um, political or, or cultural regeneration. In fact, in one of the interviews that, that Spender gave with the people who were monitoring him, um, one of the officers said, uh, Mr. Spender, in the future, there will be no culture in Germany, uh, which, of course, was extremely, um, uh, wasn't something that Spender was likely to accept. The great tragedy of this book, The European Witness, which is an extremely good book, very varied in what it chooses to, um, to describe. Uh, there, there, there are levels which are just entirely to do with the car breaking down and meeting people and talking to the driver about his uh, relationship uh, with, with the local German girls, which is actually 
a fairly ephemeral, quite interesting. In the original of the book, uh, which is in the Bancroft Library, there's a, a large section to do with the black market, which was eliminated from the final book, and also large sections to do with the gossip in the officer's mess of the future war with Russia, which they expected to be imminent. So uh, uh, these, I, well, it suggests that maybe there was some censorship, or if not censorship, some auto-censorship. These are subjects which you could not discuss so soon after the end of the Second World War is how we're going to start um, um, preparing for the Third World War. Uh, so those were eliminated from, from your, uh, the European witness. But the real tragedy is that as soon as he got back to um, England, that is to say, uh, in, the fall, in the winter of 1945, um, uh, Cyril Connolly insisted that he publish uh, at least the meeting of, uh, with Curtius, which had taken place earlier. Um, this led to a, a, an incredible dispute, uh, because Curtius said, you, know, uh, you have no right to publish uh, my, uh, the things that I said in private uh, you could, uh, without asking my permission first. What uh, Curtius said in private was, yes, a total German race nation must accept the responsibility for the Second World War. You can't just simply palm it off as being, the respons uh, being, being entirely the responsibility of the leaders, uh, the, the high command of the Nazi party. There has to be some gesture of collective guilt, um, which my father was extremely grateful to hear. He thought this was, this was exactly what he wanted to hear from a statement such as that. You could then build upwards, uh, bit by bit, a uh, new cultural identity of Germany. But Goetzius was so furious to see it in print um, that he started writing angry letters to, well, Bertrand Russell, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, and above all, T.S. Eliot. Um, so a, a, a long, twisted correspondence took place, impeded by the fact that communications with Germany were very difficult. Um, at the end of which, uh, Spender uh, guaranteed to remove Curtius from the final book, from the European Witness, which. Uh, he, he did, but unfortunately this makes the book a little bit weaker. So to read this book you also have to catch up with the, uh, the meeting with Curtius, which was in Horizon, republished in um, the book on the 1930s. It's been republished various times. So this is a book of which an essential chapter is missing. Um, uh, the, the, the rest, apart from the ephemeral descriptions of, of well, not, not ephemeral, but um, not, not, not pertinent descriptions of Germany, romantic descriptions of the ruins and sensation of, of these bonds of depression that you would get. There's a certain point when he says, uh, just the, to hear a baby cry among these ruins <clears throat> has an incredible authority, uh, partly because uh, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd just become a father himself, so this made him miss his baby back in Italy, I mean, uh, back in England. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it isn't. laughs> um, okay, so the secret uh, Foreign Office report was filed, and it's in the um, National Record Office, uh, the National Archives in Kew, um, and uh, he brings um, he, he brings Curtius into this report. He says, "Why are we helping? Um, why are we not helping um, great intellects uh, and non?" non-Nazis, such as Ernst Robert Kurzius, and in fact we're helping um, um, people who have a known Nazi background, such as Werner Schulemann. Uh, he names Werner Schulemann in the private report, and he's called WS in the book, so his anonymity is a little bit protected in European Witness. But um, on file in the um, National Archives, there is this sort of um, torpedo going into the uh, intricate um, uh, interlacing departments of the um, army of occupation of Germany. Because Werner Schulemann, who was the head of um, uh, research, medicinal research, chemical research in the University of Bonn, was uh, the head of Nazi um, um, doctors outside of Germany. He, had, he always had contacts outside of uh, Germany, he was, the head, he was the head representative of, of um, uh, the Nazi doctor. So he was a high-ranking Nazi. 
and he simply would not accept the fact that he uh, 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 being denazified. He just simply refused to accept that he'd been lost his job and been cancelled. Um, so he, he declared that in among these ruins, his house was going to be the Department of Chemical Research, which meant that it was impossible to stop him from working in it since he was living in it. He was a very versatile man and absolutely arrogant and, in, and with a certain amount of courage. He went to the Nuremberg trials to defend one of his assistants, uh, an assistant who was later hanged for having killed 250 people in medical research in one of the concentration camps. And Werner Schulemann said he's a wonderful man and, and the work that he's done is a great benefit to humanity. This man, Schulemann, is even today um, studied as a whole department of research in, in Germany, which is interested in precisely this point. If we're talking about moral responsibility, German guilt, uh, in the middle of it, there is this awful um, uh, dilemma of do you, uh, do you um, enjoy the benefits of the medical research undertaken by the Nazis, most of which was rubbish, but a certain amount of which did uh, actually improve uh, medicine or, uh, med med was, was a benefit to medical research. Do you use it or you do, do you not use it? If you don't use it, you're throwing away a piece of knowledge which has been acquired. Anyway, that sort of peripheral to um, But did Europe. he discover malaria? malaria? That's right. Uh, the, the, uh, this uh, Sch Schulman, I was forgetting to say, uh, invented a chemical substitute for um, malaria, for, for quinine, to, and uh, uh, in the huge correspondence which followed um, Spender's private uh, report, um, because this really uh, uh, irritated um, four or five departments, and they kept on passing it from one to the other. There's one um, British officer who said, uh, we cannot do anything to this man. Without him, there would have been no Burma campaign, because they used Mr. Schulman's, I mean, Dr. Schulman's um, advances in, in, in the uh, chemical with, uh, substitute for quinine, for the Burma campaign in the in Southeast Pacific. Okay, that that's one of the un, unusual aspects of it. Um, by accident, because of the car breaking down um, at the end of uh, his tour, he met Ernst Junger, who I've discussed. The, the, the Ernst Junger was uh, the most decorated German soldier of the First World War. Um, uh, he joined, he was very young when he joined, 17 I think. Um, by the end of the war he'd, he'd been decorated 23 times and had been wounded 19 times. And he was the kind of hero that um, the Nazis would have loved to have incorporated into the Nazi system of ideology. But Ernst Jünger just simply refused to have anything to do with them. He was in, in a little bit, he, you could say that he was a snob in a sense, he thought that the the, Ger the German, the, 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 the Nazis, which are simply unspeakable people, and he didn't want to have anything to do, do with them on a social level. But uh, he was left alone, he went right the way through the Second World War, he joined the army, he went to um, Paris, where he sort of pretended that the war was not taking place. He saw his French friends, Maud uh, among them, um, and uh, one of the things that he asks Spender to do when they meet by accident is to take a letter to Maud who's and uh, giving a certain amount of trouble. And think, wasn't he murdered? Not that long ago? Uh, 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 well, anyway, he was, a, he was a, a, a collaborate, French collaborator, which um, Jünger seemed to think was um, a matter of no concern. Um, so, in its strange way, Jünger also had a vision of um, reconstructing Germany. Um, uh, that is to say, recreating uh, uh, a united culture between France and Germany. Um, and Curtius also who was a great French scholar, had the same idea. All this f fell to pieces, unfortunately, because of Curtius losing his temper, and because my father uh, had only just understood who Junger was, detested uh, blood and steel, and spoke about fighting in the First World War. It was ab absolutely the opposite of it. But he admitted that it was an absolutely terrific book, but it was um, disgusting as well. I think in, in European Witnesses he says this is a disgusting book. Um, meeting Junger in the, in the flesh, a short man, very neat and tidy, um, the absolute opposite of what you think of a bully. Uh, 
Ensign, who just happened to be a very good soldier, um, and in, in, blood and, um, in blood and steel. Um, there's even comic moments. There's a moment when a Junger loses his iron cross in the middle of combat, and him and his Batman, um, or his assistant, go down on their hands and knees in the middle of being fired at by the British soldiers to look for his iron cross, and it takes them five minutes to find it. Uh, and it's a very long five minutes, but he finds it and goes back. Hey, this is sort of irrelevant. Um, Otto von Bismarck, whom he met, Spender met, with Ernst Jünger, uh, was trying to start a teaching, a teaching program for um, uh, uh, rehabilitating German youth. The difficulty was that uh, the British Army refused to allow um, uh, ex-soldiers to be um, used as teachers. So uh, Otto von Bismarck was uh, just come out of the uh, German army. He didn't say, uh, he didn't explain that in the Nazi period, the German army was one way of escaping from the Nazi party. Um, it was called in, in, inner, exile, inner, inner exile within Germany. Um, because you could find yourself in a contingent of the German army which had no Nazis in it and you could then talk publicly openly. If you were then used by the Nazi party to fight Germany's war, well, that certainly was an ambivalent predicament, but at least you didn't have to um, uh, go into exile. Ex exile for many people was an unacceptable ch uh, uh, choice. Um, uh, just because the Nazis had taken over the, uh, Germany, you, uh, didn't, you did, didn't feel obliged to have to leave Germany as a, as a result. So th this is a, an interesting book with so many open um, doors which don't, which don't get followed up at the time, possibly because they couldn't be followed up at the time. Uh, 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 Spender's attitude to Otto von Bismarck is in the end quite suspicious because the idea of, 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 of transporting ex-army officers into a teaching program is exactly the opposite of what he, what he thought that he was trying to, to achieve. Uh, uh, if you're trying to denazify Germany, then surely it would be uh, very counterproductive to in, in, in debt into the teaching service. There's a lot of our army officers who happen to be friends of Otto von Bismarck. Um, equally, when he goes to see Adenauer there again, he meets Adenauer, uh, Conrad Adenauer at a very particular moment. It's about a fortnight before the British decide that they don't, they don't trust Adenauer and they sack him from his job of mayor of Cologne. They're right not to trust uh, Adenauer because at a time when it was illegal to start political activists, activities in Germany, Adenauer is secretly trying to establish uh, a political party, uh, ostensibly local, but that collectively would add up to being a national party. And one of the things that he proposes to spend and spend in perfect innocence, writes it in uh, uh, European Witness, is that the uh, uh, Frankfurt of the Allgemeine should have a Kölnische Allgemeine. The two newspapers, the main newspaper of, of, of Frankfurt, should have a northern edition, in fact publishing the same kind of articles. In other words, you have a mass communication all over Germany, although you are obeying the, uh, the, the, the uh, command of the British um, occupying forces to keep the two uh, things separate. Well, anyway, Adenauer, a fortnight later, lost his job. Um, and he did, in the end, succeed in <coughs> founding the CDU, the uh, uh, Christian Democrat Party. Uh, and he led it, and he was a uh, chancellor four times, I believe. Um, and there again, by sheer luck, Spender meets this person, has an interesting conversation with huge ramifications. One of the assistants <coughs> now in that office is an ex-Nazi, although it's <coughs> didn't realize it at the time. So. This is a book which, uh, if you can, uh, uh, pleasurable to read, with very interesting, as uh, Lara says, very interesting things to do with the emotive reaction to uh, the site of Germany and its state of destruction. Um, but at the same time, if you're seeing it as a political book, uh, there's, there are lots of doors which have been opened in a most casual way, um, begging, um, uh, teams of PhD students to go in there and, and trace all the details, uh, subsequent details. But in the end, it remains a personal book. Uh, he, he, meant, he published it. Uh, he didn't survive the, the relationship with Kurtzius. Unfortunately, he could not survive. Um, and eventually, Spender 
lost interest in Germany because of the failure of the relationship with Curtius, and then became uh, uh, more interested in making this axis between America and <coughs> England rather than England and Europe. It was just too difficult. Uh, opposition uh, in the British Army and in the British Parliament to make that kind of a unity in Europe, as we all know, took another 30 years. <coughs> and even now, um, there are many people who are diffident about it. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Spender and Coetzee's. It's been mentioned, this is as well, but Coetzee's has been mentioned a few times by both uh, Matthew and, and Lara. And um, I'm working towards um, a comparative study of these um, two authors. Um, so I'll just, just give a go anyway. So um, Stephen Spender, the authorised biography, gives only occasional glimpses of the poet's relationship with the man who, along with Auden and Isherwood, provided him with what he considered his deepest friendships. I'm referring to Ernest Robert Coetzeus, the most affable man and one of the ablest critics Spender ever met, with whom, critics argue, Spender had a formative relationship. Spender's relationship with Coetzeus even prompted the biographer Sutherland to state that a thesis remains to be written about the influence of Coetzeus' thinking on Spender's writing. Now fear not, I am not offering that thesis here today, but rather I seek to sketch a comparative study of these two writers who I'm coming to think are quite closely intellectually aligned. So Coetzeus was born um, in the border region of Elsass uh, in 1860, 1886, and from an early age was aware of the differing cultures surrounding him and the dangers of nationalism. So when he was a young boy, the uh, Franco-Prussian War uh, took place uh, from 1870 to 71, um, after which Strasbourg, where the Coetzeuses were living, uh, was ceded to Germany. And his awareness of these problems um, were also undoubtedly the problems of nationalism were also undoubtedly sharpened uh, when he served and was injured during World War I. Now Spender, almost a whole generation younger than Coetzeus, came to know the philologist when the latter translated some of Spender's poems, which appeared in Oxford Poetry in 1929. Coetzeus translated the poems for the Neue uh, Schweizer Wundschau. Um, of course, they had at that time also a friend in common, uh, Coetzeus had also translated um, T.S. Eliot's uh, The Wasteland into German in 1927. This initial instance then of cultural transfer or exchange through translation led to a friendship and one of the, uh, the, and one of the main reasons for Spender's trip to Germany in 1930 uh, was Coetzeus who was by then in his mid-40s and a professor in Bonn. Spender indicates that Coetzeus directly and personally mediated aspects of German culture to him. Uh, he said, with Coetzeus, I was in contact, and this was mentioned by Matthew earlier, I was in contact with Germany of Goethe, Hölderlin, and Schiller. Um, it was an Apollonian Germany, a Germany of the sun, not the Dionysian Germany of Hitler. We read Hölderlin together, and later on, the poems of the Greek anthology. Now this pupil-teacher relationship continued uh, throughout the 1930s and it involved Coetzeus reading some of Spender's work and criticising it um, and another aspect of it was reading together and translating. Spender translated Stefan Georg's writing and in August 1935 Spender stayed with Coetzeus for five days um, in order to revise a Hölderlin translation. Thus from the outset and on a practical level, here we have a relationship which is based on mutual exchange and transfer. Both on the personal, interpersonal and public level, Coetzeus uh, transfers English culture, so Eliot and Spender's poetry, to, uh, to a German audience. And on the other side, Spender, through his translations especially, uh, mediates German culture to the Anglophone world. Um, so Coetzeus' efforts at mediating uh, cultures um, also involved his writing for the Criterion at the invitation of T.S. Eliot no less than three times in 1923, 24 and 27. 
And by 1930, all of Curtius's output was dominated by one concern, to reaffirm the German intellectual inheritance without abandoning his commitment to a cosmopolitan ideal of culture. Um, but um, by 1932, he gave up uh, this fight, uh, trying to fight politics with culture, until after the war. Um, and in the war years, um, he developed his ideas further, and other German um, thinkers, some, uh, for example, um, Erich Auerbach, um, also uh, worked in this way and then produced uh, their major pieces of work uh, after the war because they couldn't bring them out during the war. Now Spender similarly uh, functioned as a, a transferent of German culture through his translations of, for example, Schiller's Maria Stuart, Büchner's Danton's Tod, and Rilke's uh, Duenese uh, Elegie. Furthermore, his poetry took up German themes. We have Beethoven's Death Mask, Van der Lubbe, and the, the, the Shadow of War, etc. Of course, his, bio, his autobiography, World Within World, and European Witness, as we've heard, continued to mediate Germany and German culture to the Anglophone audience. Um, through his meetings with uh, in European Witness, with Kurzius, um, Adenauer, Ernst Junger, all of whom we've heard of already, um, uh, he, uh, and with the help of um, a, per, a permit to fraternize, he managed to compile a substantial spectrum of uh, intellectual opinions. He also continued to network and to visit further cross-national projects. With Jünger, uh, Spender discussed a new venture, an international review of Europe, and I think this may have been what, what um, Martin was referring to. Um, Um, so while um, it's, it's important also to point out that this was the, the, this um, active attempt to uh, translate or transfer um, for Spender uh, German culture to Britain and for and also for Kurzius uh, Anglophone and foreign culture within Germany was at best a risky but at worst a very dangerous enterprise. Because Anglo-German antagonisms uh, were on the increase, um, as suggested by the fact that when, in 1932, Spender asked Kurzius to accept the dedication of poems 1933, the older scholar refused, frightened of repercussions given the, on uh, the, the ominous political atmosphere. While Sutherland suggests that Kurzius was an influential figure for Spender's prose because of his view that medieval European poetry was the first manifestation of modernism, one can, in the first instance, um, demonstrate here that these writers had similar intellectual inclinations, manifested in the parallels between their intell intellectual activities, which I've just um, set out, um, and um, also the, um, these inclinations which they had um, were arrived at, it seems, in different ways. Now, the direction which Curtius's work took was dictated by his personal experiences of external pressures, namely the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War and later the coming of the Nazis to power. Kurzius' work, work since the beginning was concerned with the connections between peoples, especially within Europe. His early writing sought to uh, promote an exchange of ideas between French and German intellectuals that would eventually lead to a new unity of the European mind. To mediate between the literary consciousness of France and Germany was for Kurzius not a theoretical proposition but a cultural program. Indeed, the conjunction of circumstances meant that this program can also be viewed politically. Um, his collection of essays, uh, essays on European literature, and indeed all of his work, reveal his idea of a mind of Europe united through literature. This, according to Koval, determined the direction of his scholarship as well as the choice of his themes and his attitude towards them. He made actual connections with writers from other cultures, including Gilles Valerie, Elliot, who we've heard of, Joyce, Hofmannsthal, Ortega, and of course, Stephen Spender. Kurzius's contacts with the representatives of these different cultures brought his attention to the related elements, uh, and his investigation into to the European literary tradition is a work of synthesis. Kurzius's entire intellectual project, therefore, can be viewed as a reaction to political situations and to the process of othering, which is associated with nationalism. By conceding some common ground, this processing of, of, process of othering is less easy. 
uh, Spender's um, autobiography suggests the cultivation of similar inclinations in himself through his maternal grandmother, who he describes as one of the most important influences um, on his life. Through her, he was exposed to other European culture, Chekhov, Ibsen, and Strindberg are mentioned, um, uh, uh, um, uh, as a teenager. Um, he notes her sympathy for the defeated Germans, which he shared um, with her after the Second War, and her grief at the shrieking hatred of the newspaper headlines, adding that fundamentally, everyone was the same uh, primary human being for her. She grieved over the lack of love um, as the guiding spirit of the world. The poet himself described how he felt um, other um, at, at, at various stages, and I'll just give a quotation from, um, this is from World of the World. When at the age of 16, I became aware of our Jewish blood, I began to feel Jewish. At school, there, was, there were many Hempstead Jews. I began to realize that I had more in common with the sensitive, rather soft, inquisitive, interior Jewish boys than with the aloof, hard, external English. There was a vulnerability, a tendency to self-hatred and self-pity and underlying, and an underlying perpetual mourning amounting to at times to amounting at times to spiritual defeatism about my own nature, which even to myself, in my English surroundings, seemed foreign. Therefore, from a very young age, we know that Spender too, albeit in a different way, became conscious of being other and feeling other. Um, and this is, this is also um, expressed um, in European Witness, um, where Spender uh, is addressing the question of guilt uh, for uh, the Anglophone reader. And he again attempts to bring these opposed cultures, so different people, to, together. So in quotation, there, is guilt, there is, is guilt of the German people, and every German has a certain relation or responsibility to that guilt. That is the sense in which the phrase collective that is the sense in which the phrase collective guilt is true. It does not mean that every German is equally guilty, but that every German should be conscious of guilt. Nor does German guilt give the Allies an automatic moral ascendancy, a kind of credit which gives them leave uh, to behave as they like in Germany until such time as they decide that it is necessary to stop doing so in order to avoid becoming as guilty as the Germans. My neighbor's crime may make him worse than me, but it does not make me better than him. On the contrary, while making him worse, it may make me worse as well. Here again, we see this tendency to collapse the constructs of us and them, to bring English and German, indeed self and other, closer together. In the introduction to the German edition of World Within World, uh, Spender points out that, the first, that what first motivated him and Isherwood to go to Germany 10 years after the First World War and why they felt drawn to Germany and to the Germans was because of a Wilfred Owen poem, Strange Meeting, wherein Owen presents an imaginary conversation between an English and a German soldier who had killed each other. The poem ends, I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in, the, in this dark. For so you frowned. Yesterday, through me, you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. What is very interesting about this poem in relation to this med uh, meditation on Spender and Quirtius is that the foes, the opposites, the German and the Englishman, are equated. Common ground and understanding between the self and the other is found, so that the other is less other. Spender and Quirtius, in their commitments to mediating the other, in many instances, through literature, for example, um, in many instances, also the enemy, um, um, are again here uh, motivated by by the same objective. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe we could talk about Spender's attitude towards the occupation in general, um, and whether he was at odds with those people, the, more, the more colonial uh, aspect of the occupation. Matthew quoted uh, the, the person before he left, he said, the spender said, I want to go to Germany so I can see what, what remains of German culture and is that there's such things as German culture in Europe. Um, do you think that opposition was there throughout his career? Well, the, the, the occupying forces had to deal with nine million refugees and uh, uh, completely destroyed infrastructure to do with the, uh, uh, yeah, the cities. Uh, um, they were faced with the Germans themselves dying of starvation during the, the, the war. Um, 
the only solution to do that, uh, to, to solve these problems, which were purely logistical, was uh, to treat Germany um, as if it was part of the British Empire. And there's an early passage in the world within world where uh, someone says, uh, yes, we're longing to be let become part of the uh, British Empire, and it's perfectly obvious that this is, what you, this is why you've chosen the northern part of Germany. Uh, you, you're making a bridge, it's uh, Die Brücke. Um, you've, you've chosen the Hamburg area, which has always been tremendously pro-English, uh, and the northern Baltic. You've uh, allowed the central bit to be taken over by the French and the Americans. But we're longing to become part of the, assimilated into the um, um, British Empire, and maybe somebody asks him, maybe in 10 years' time, do you think you could apply for dominion status? <laughs> Which seems an incredible thing to say. And uh, then I came across some, this, this, this little piece of doggerel um, which shows that the, the Germans were perfectly aware that the, Brit the British were treating them like part of the British Empire. Gott gib uns ein fünftes Reich, das vierte ist dem dritten gleich. God gave us a fifth empire because the fourth, i.e. the British one, is just like the third. Which is uh, kind of tough circumstances. But um, the, 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 the policy which uh, uh, Spender thought was completely useless was the non-fraternization policy. The non-fraternization policy was irritating also to the soldiers themselves because it actually acerbated this business about, it sort of forced the British to treat this part of the world as if it's a conquered country and a part of the empire, do this, do that. On the other hand, um, I think that in the circumstances, the logistics were so difficult stopping large numbers of people from starving, uh, solving the problem of the displaced persons that were roaming around in vans, uh, arming themselves, and then um, uh, punishing the local Germans. But actually, it's sort of peripheral to Spender's concern. He's not there to give, uh, to show up the poverty, has to be said, of um, British planning, American planning, everybody's planning, for the post-war situation. There doesn't seem to have been any, any, uh, anything more than practical improvisation um, in, in terms of how Germany was supposed to put itself back together after this war. Uh, 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 the only people who seem to have been vaguely aware of this problem, there's another passage towards the end of the book, is when he, he finds himself in the, the messes and the, uh, the, the uh, cave and the, and the you know, has to sleep and eat with the RAF. The RAF uh, participated in the total destruction of Germany. They seem to have a, a, a conscience of what they've done, but because they are the RAF, they're not in direct contact with the Germans, so they live in this strange kind of limbo. Um, but his primary concern is Germany. It's not, it's not to criticize or, or uh, even advise um, the, the British occupying forces, other than to suggest that the education of the of Germans should be placed on a higher priority. When the, when he, he, um, the report is finally read, because of course nobody read it for several months, um, the Foreign Office uh, says that some of this is getting to be out of date, um, ignores the, uh, 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 we are doing much more um, uh, about education, um, and we are also doing as much as we possibly can to uh, uh, bring um, textbooks to Germany, but we have a paper shortage in this country. So uh, they accept it as being a just criticism that education should take a, a higher priority. Adenauer was talking about spiritual um, renaissance of uh, Germany, but then his, his, his idea was to um, create a political party which is also a Christian party. So um, with Adenauer, it was slightly confusing whether he's promoting a Christian renaissance or a political party. I suppose I was just struck um, rereading it, because I, I think our sense of Spender is very much that he's going there to reinvigorate the great culture. He wants to, to rediscover the, the good Germans. Um, and I was struck reading it that he is quite prepared to, I mean, the passage you quoted about collective guilt, it's, it's not the sort of simple message of collective guilt, but he's still prepared to sort of blame the Germans. Um, Oh, and absolutely. I think it's not. And when the Germans sort of defend themselves... I think he's quite objective. Like, yeah. He sees things very clearly. Um, he's not, uh, <laughs> he's not um, uh, you know, I, I think it's not that he's afraid to kind of apportion blame. Um, but 
but too much of that doesn't get yes. anywhere. And he's very conscious of that, I think. And he's quite pragmatic at, at seeing there's that passage where he says, where people say to him, do you think we're being too kind to the Germans? And he says, it's not a question of kindness or unkindness. Yeah. It's a question that even if pragmatically we see the Germans having done everything wrong, yeah. um, we have more to gain by allowing workers to work than it's done. I mean, it's just an amazing, what really kind of struck me was how, uh, how, he seemed to be so many things all at once. That's uh, such a diplomatic kind of stance to take, you know. Um, I mean, I think the last time we um, were talking, I, I mentioned um, Stefan Zweig, um, who uh, was a, 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 a Viennese, um, who was in the UK, was exiled to the UK for a time. But he, you know, was also conscious of, of um, what was lost and the destruction. Um, but also what the wrong way to go afterwards, which would be to kind of uh, make Germany the, you know, cast, uh, cast them kind of out and um, make them suffer and suffer and suffer. Um, um, that wasn't the way forward. Um, and um, I think Churchill was aware of that and he, um, apparently I think I said to you, uh, had uh, his cabinet read Spine's mm -hmm. book. Yeah, um, um, and that Spender had that kind of insight at that time it was was quite. Uh, it's yeah. pretty good on British guilt as well as German guilt, which yeah. is a bit paradoxical. Uh, the British, despite their respect for individuals, are rulers of an empire, and it is here that their danger lies. Directly they go abroad, they start generalizing about the natives. This tendency towards facile generalization is surely shown in the extreme reluctance to distinguish between anti-Nazis and Nazis, or at all events between anti-Nazis and other Germans. The officers, far more than the rank and file, refuse to recognize that every German is a separate human being. They refuse to see that we must treat the Germans on a relationship of man to man, and not of, of, of man to guilty beast. Mm. Which is quite yeah. idealistic. Yeah. Sure it is, yes. And more so than well, other things he said. Well, it's about. quite unusual to see a book uh, which is, st starts out uh, to, to define German guilt, and then on the way discovers that you have to define English guilt at the same time. I mean, I think, I think that Ian Baruma's book on, on war guilt, yeah, which is a fantastic book, First of all, it says um, it's almost impossible for defeated people to feel war guilt because the experience of defeat is so devastating that any other sentiment is just simply sh eliminated, shot on one side. Mm -hmm. Which is an awful thing to say, but I think it's a fairly human thing to say that there should be that kind of a reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, but not even Baruma starts arguing about guilt being um, something which cuts both ways, as it were. Mm -hmm. Talking of which, I thought maybe we could talk briefly about um, his poem, Responsibility for Pilots Who Destroyed yeah. Germany. Did he write that after going to Germany? Um, should we read it? Um, Germany, spring 1945. I stood on a rooftop and they wove their cage, their murmuring, throbbing cage in the air of blue crystal. I saw them gleam above the town like diamond bolts, conjoining invisible struts of wire, carrying through the sky their squadron's cage, woven by instincts, delicate as a shoal of flashing fish. They went. They left a silence in our streets below, but, but they left a silence in our streets, below which boys gone to school we leave in their playground. A silence of asphalt, a privet hedge of staring wall. In the blue emptied sky, their diamonds had scratched long curving finest whitest lines. These the days soon melted into satin ribbons, falling over heaven's terraces near the sun. Oh, that April morning, they carried my will, exalted, expanding, singing in their aerial cage. They carried my will. They dropped it on a German town. My will exploded. Tall buildings fell down. Then, when the ribbons faded and the sky forgot, 
and April was concerned with building nests and being hot, I began to rem remember the lost names and faces. Now I tie the ribbons torn down from those terraces around the most hidden images in my line, and my life, which never paid the price of their wounds, turns thoughts over and over like a propeller, assumes their guilt, honours, repents, prays for them. Yeah? Should we just talk about it quickly? Do you, do you know the, the context of his writing? This must be early April, 25, 6 before he goes to Germany. He's seen a lot of people. Okay, so he, he hasn't yet seen, because I felt it was the sort of response to the, the ruined city, basically, the Jews. No, I think that's before they left, because otherwise children were playing on the street. Um, I, I know that there was a, a moment when he was in the fire service um, when uh, sitting in a railway carriage, um, he sees that there's an airman looking at him very intently and says, and the airman says to him, it's you chaps that we're sorry for when we set off at night. Mm -hmm. I.e. no distinction between the fact that uh, Spender was a, a British fire, fireman and um, they were off to bomb German cities, not, obviously not English cities. Mm -hmm. He was particularly good at seeing um, um, uh, reciprocal evil, as it were. Mm -hmm. Once you get into a war situation, it's very, very difficult to start distinguishing between um, degrees of evil. He would like, he, he did want tremendously people to recognize um, the evil of the, of the concentration camps. Um, he, there's an early moment when he meets someone um, who describes being in a concentration camp for seven years, uh, dig digging out uh, peat. It quite, comes quite early in the book. Um, it's clear that Spender doesn't quite believe uh, that this, uh, this man who's haranguing him, giving us a mad speech with no details in it about the horror of inhumanity of man to man, whereas Spender would like to have heard something very specific about the concentration camp. Instead, this man is uh, being transcendental about the experience he's been through. I think the best thing about that, the concentration camp message is, is that bit where he sends the concentration camp in the upstairs because they're not allowed to recognize officially in, his, in the dining room where he's having breakfast. And then he's left feeling quite guilty about the fact that he has a sumptuous breakfast where this man is going upstairs. Oh, yes. um, and then he thinks, um, and then he's, but, but, but then he says to us, but that didn't stop me eating because Guilt makes me anxious, and when I'm anxious, I'm very greedy. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and that sort of Spender's honesty pushed far further. I mean, that's sort of what's always mm -hmm. best about him. It's that sense that he's never going to quite not tell us that thing that's a bit embarrassing about him, um, which stops him being as sanctimonious and maybe idealistic as he is our friend. But at which point, maybe we should. But I am quite, I do think that poem feels like it's a sort of overlaying, I suppose, of, um, of the imagined destruction in Germany and the actual destruction in Germany. It's like a, it's a, it's a remembered moment of having seen uh, 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 I don't know, but I think that probably was fire service and, and um, air force, and it's written from the English. I'll, I'll have to look it up. I'll yeah, find out. But what I was, going to, I was going to finish this, the, 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 the concentration. Sorry. Uh, uh, well, uh, mm -hmm. he didn't believe um, that this man could have spent seven years in a concentration camp. Um, well, thank heavens for Wikipedia and Google and all this, but it took me all of five minutes to discover that there were a whole series of concentration camps um, where they sent actors um, and musicians. And their punishment, uh, Dantesque punishment, was to drain these moors by hand. I mean, draining a moor means uh, digging a ditch and then the water goes into the ditch and then the moors uh, dry out and then you plow the field and scatter the good seed on the land. So uh, setting rather, these rather human Chinese. beings, <laughs> using these people to, to um, use picks and shovels on the, on the peat, um, well, uh, it was better than many other solutions to these. Uh, they weren't actually murdered. And in fact, uh, pressing more buttons on the computer, I discovered that after the war, um, a lot of these um, actors and um, singers and musicians 
went back to have themselves photographed or filmed um, uh, singing the Moor Soldier's song. The Moor Soldier's song is we're going off to uh, drain the moors, we're drain the moors, we've got our pick and shut. And this apparently became very popular on the Eastern Front. Uh, in the siege of Leningrad, the soldiers started singing this song, we're off to train the moors. So there was a little fragment of, of German culture, macabre you might call it, um, but indicating that in the horrible world of concentration camps, there were also varying degrees. Uh, and these people at least were saved from having to fight in the Second World War by, by the fact that they were draining the wars. I'm quite grateful for it. And then it happens that in Italy where I lived there was a composer who I needed to go to correct uh, um, an arrangement that I'd made for my village band, a man called Peter Fischer. So I described the story, tried to be friendly. Uh, uh, he was an East German, a little bit difficult to get on with. It. Defensive. And I mentioned this story about the Moor soldiers, and he said, Yes, that was written by my teacher. And he started singing the Moor soldiers song. He's anyway. a very famous man. Peter Fischer. Mm. He succeeded Kurt Weil in writing music for Bert Brecht. Mm -hmm. He lives in our village. Anyway, uh, the, the, part, the only point I'm making in re relation to this book mm. is uh, it, it's a little bit like one of those. Um, um, things you have at Christmas where you open little doors and there's something mm. happening behind the doors. Mm. There's so many chunks of this book mm. which open a, 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 a fragment which he could, uh, a spender at the time couldn't follow, follow up. I mean, mm. the, the, the idea of having degrees of concentration camps, let alone the song of war soldiers, um, it was not something, uh, inner exile was something that you couldn't follow up in 1945. Should we open the book? Questions? Yes? As, as um, you as a creator, as a member of the Tiki, and saw what happened in Germany after the war, and was years following, did you see the way that they tried to deal with the sense of what was collective guilt and how would they approach it? How would they try to teach children about it? What do you think of that? I have an impression that um, he lost interest in Germany after his friendship with Kultius died. Kultius wouldn't forgive him for this uh, dastardly deed of publishing his words in a magazine. And well, in fact, he did see him before he died. A couple of times, yes, but it wasn't doing really well. Uh, uh, in the letters with Eliot, um, there's a point when a spender says, I, I, I know I'm in the wrong, and I feel very badly about it, and I've apologized four times to Kurtzius, but I've apologized so many times that I'm beginning to feel a little less in the wrong than I did. <laughs> <laughs> because after all, people like Kurtz, yes, they're in a position to, if they make this apology public, uh, um, it, it doesn't cost them anything. And then after they've made some public declaration of this kind, we can start again, we can build upon it. You know? So he, in the end, although he was totally in the wrong, um, he did feel a little bit resentful to Kurtz for having taken this point of view. Also, when you go back and read the passages about Kutzius, it's always, I'm, I'm always surprised by how sort of innocuous they are, really. I mean, yeah. Yes, well, uh, there's a bit which doesn't go into European witness, um, uh, but is connected. It's in the Bancroft manuscript. Um, uh, there, there's a, a diary which then goes into this and went into the Kutzius account in Horizon magazine. Um, at certain point, Kutzius asks him, can you get my clothes back? Because the first thing that happened to him is that some officers came and they cleaned out my cupboard, and I cannot teach without a nice suit. Um, so Spender thinks this is a pretty amazing thing. But dutifully, he goes along to see the supply officer um, and says, I'm terribly sorry to trouble you, but uh, Kurtzius, well, he's a very important professor, and he does need to have his best suit in order to teach. And the officer gets up from his desk and he goes to the door, he opens the door, and there's a whole queue of truly desperate people asking for much more than a suit of clothes. And so the officer says, I'll do my best, Mr. Spender, but honestly, 
These people are looking for their loved ones. They're trying to get back to their houses. They've lost this, that, and the other. I don't think I can give priority to find them back. And in the, in the diary, it goes on. I wish he'd put this in the book, of course. I would have, that would have blown any possibility of, of having any uh, uh, um, reconstructing this relationship, of course. Uh, but I mean, it might have been worth it at that point, since they didn't speak afterwards anyway. It might even have been hung for sheep or for a lamb. But anyway, it says, what is it about a German professor that he needs a suit to teach him? I mean, can he not teach unless he has the suit? Does, does the knowledge come with a suit? <laughs> <laughs> and what is the difference between a German professor, an English professor's teacher, a teacher's suit, and the officer, uh, the, the, the suit of an officer who's in the army? Says he in a rather sinister way. But anyway, all that gets lost and it's in the bankrupt and somebody else can do it up. Jason. It, 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 I mean, it'd be a great scholarly service if this uh, bankrupt, bankrupt manuscript was be made available. Um, especially with those wonderful photographs. It's the first time I've seen many of them. The photographs are not in the Bancroft thing. They're in the Spender archive, and as soon as I get around to it, I'll give them to the, um, what's it called, that archive? What, you? No. No. Um, Bridgman. 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 Getty. Getty. No. Not Getty. No, the, uh, she just lives around the corner. Um, Bridgman. Bridgman. Bridgman archive. I'm just too lazy to do it, you know. There's something so awful about cleaning up a photograph in Photoshop. Um, I just uh, put it at the bottom of my priorities. But they're nice photographs, and I will sooner or later put them there. And the Bank of Manuscript, you're hoping to publish those extracts in a new edition of your book? I, I, I do not know what to do with this book. Um, I've, I've worked at it quite a lot. I've, I've given it sort of three or four months had it scanned and, and typed and checked. Uh, I traced the, the Secret Service report and the comments on the report um, and scanned and tidied up the Horizon versions um, and collated with the Bancroft manuscript. Um, but I, I, I don't know where, I, I don't, I, it's a huge editorial job. To begin with, the European witness, because Curtius was removed, as a chapter in the middle of going to Paris and talking to the people in Paris about their more experiences. And, um, you know, it's like having um, cauliflower for breakfast, as the Italians say. <laughs> it just simply does not fit in the book because the experience of being defeated and pretending that you've won, which was the French predicament. There are no French scholars here who are going to say that's a terrible way of putting it. But it was, that, that was their predicament. They had to pretend they'd won the Second World War or they'd lost. They had to pretend that the, the partisans had freed France, whereas in fact it was the American armies which freed France. You know, the, the, this goes on to this very day, this anxiety about the, the state of defeat. It was a different kind of Same defeat religion. from the German. Same religion. Same religion. Um, Taboo subject. Absolutely difficult subject. Uh, so if I, was to, if I was to start touching this book, I'd throw away French chapter, and I would add the Horizon magazine, and I would add, add chunks from the, the Bancroft Library, and I would add also an unpublished chapter from the Temple, early uh, version of the Temple, which gives his very first view of Germany in 1929. Well, but at that point, I'm not. I'm much related to all of this. Um, <laughs> I mean, I read, I reread the book um, today, and I noticed in the, in, in the introduction it says. In some cases, I, I have invented characters or incidents in order to convey some impression which could not be conveyed more directly. That's now, now, given your knowledge of all the, all the, all the manuscripts, I, I wonder if you could tell me what those... those that, that's Paracoulo, that is the okay. fantastic. He's saving his ass uh, in case Kurtz has still managed to get him, because there are tiny little hints of Kurtz as his presence. He's, he's going to pretend he's invented them. But actually, uh, Spender was not very good at turning real life into fiction. So uh, even, even the, the fiction is, 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 is always very close to uh, real experience. And the, the way he wrote poems is he was very faithful to a moment of vision in, that's, uh, that inspired the poem. Um, it works when, when he uses 
that kind of relationship with reality in a poem, but it makes it very difficult if you're trying to fictionalize reality. Uh, uh, Isherwood does it much, much better because to him, there is no truth. They, they're just people who are acting in a rather peculiar way which you can somehow um, push in uh, the direction of fiction, as if they're already acting some fictional part. They're not, they're not real, the people in, in Isherwood's work. They're, they're already being um, tr trans transmogrified, what is it, done, right, uh, in, into something which is uh, uh, fictional. So do you know which of the characters in here are invented? No, not, not in this book. No, I don't think they are invented. Well, he said they, I mean, Jason's right. They, 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 I, I think that's just my father trying to save himself in case um, mm -hmm. uh, the culture gets worked mm -hmm. up again. Like the disclaimer at the end, the end of the film. Yeah, 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 the, the, um, yeah, yeah. No connection with reality in any possible way. Um, I was reading an issue uh, uh, on the Rugen Island, is one of the uh, Berlin stories about Ishwood. Um, and it describes a very neurotic English boy um, who's been treated very badly by his current German boyfriend. Um, and he's accepting it all because he's a bit of a masochist. And there's a bit when uh, Isherwood explains the background of the English boy. Every phrase is true, but comes from a different person. There's a phrase which comes out of my father's life, there's a phrase which comes out of Francis Turbo Peter's life, and there's another one that comes out of Robson Scott's life. Put together, they do form, actually, an imaginable fictional character. But, uh, it, it, um, it's completely fascinating, of course, because it's it's something which my father could not do. He couldn't he couldn't he couldn't do the sort of collage thing of arranging reality so that it become uh, a, a change into all of fiction. That's an extraordinary tour de force on, on issue its part. A lot of the stories in the Berlin stories were things which happened to my father, who she then tell uh, Christopher, and Christopher would write him up. Part of the anxiety of the quarrel, uh, which meant that they that Spender never went back to Berlin after 1932, they had a terrible quarrel, um, is because uh, uh, Ishmael was slightly anxious that uh, Spender would write his version of his stories before he managed to issue to manage to shut them into the Berlin stories. More questions to do with Germany? But I guess I had one, in that uh, your description of the Apollonian Germany uh, struck me very much of, of how close Stephen Spender was to Michael Hamburger, who was a German Jew ah, who came to London, ah, ah, ah. fought in the British Army, and the sensitivity factor as well was very, very close to... I was just reading the correspondence between um, Spender and, and Hamburger in the Bodleian just two days ago. Complicated story. Uh, Hamburger had a terrible depression at the beginning of the war, and Spender writes a letter saying, um, "Cheer up. Uh, of course, the situation is absolutely terrible, but we, we can none of us allow ourselves to be overcome by depression." A nice letter, and um, and I think that probably Hamburger managed to pull himself together. It's a it's a good supportive letter. Then uh, with this business about Hölderlin. Uh, introduced by Kurtzius to Hölderlin, uh, Spender was completely fascinated by Hölderlin and the life, and wanted to write a libretto uh, for an opera to be written by Roger Sessions at some point, I think. Um, not that it ever got that far. Um, don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he was going to do a translation of Hölderlin with Michael Hamburger, and it went on for quite a long time. but. Uh, just between us lot, um, Spender's knowledge of German was not up to Michael Hamburger's um, uh, standards. Um, and if Hamburger then wrote a four-page letter saying, in line 23, you've made a slight gap here, it shouldn't be this, it should be that, mm -hmm. and in line 28, you should be doing this and not that. I, I can just imagine my father saying, fuck this, I'm just going to go on with it any longer. So the, the translation of Hölderlin never actually got um, um, published. It's a shame. It's a shame. Hamburger translated the whole lot yes. with Routledge. 
um, yeah. later in the fifties, I think. Mm. So he was he was working. Well, originally, it was going to have been done with uh, yeah. Spender, but a mixture of frustration at his own um, lack of knowledge and mm -hmm. lack of time too, because mm -hmm. translation doesn't earn anything, and, uh, and the, the correspondence includes. They were going to translate together uh, Der Tutum, a huge thing by Hölderlin, which goes on for uh, 90 pages or something. And then their letters saying, well, all right, will you do the first version, I'll give you 40 pounds. And then and the, the award we're going to be given is, um, is 65 pounds anyway. And then... Do we have one final question? Do you think that Spender went to America because he could earn money at the universities there? Damn right. right. No university <laughs> in Germany could pay him. Not at all. So yes, exactly. He went where he was paid. I certainly don't think he wanted to be a German prof with a uniform and all the rest of it. But he did prefer <laughs> German culture to French culture. Yes. Well, with this Well, we, we, um, uh, with this business about Mr. Schulemann, the, the uh, despicable, horrible Nazi medicine doctor Schulemann, mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I was in communication with some people in. in um, Heidelberg, I think, because uh, Schulemann is a test case. They, they love him because it's so awful. Um, the, mor the moral predicament of Schulemann is so absolutely terrible. Everybody's adores examining it. I, I was told the first generation uh, of survivors of the Second World War did not talk about it with anybody. Silence. The second generation, which is our generation of the 1960s, were very recriminatory, saying, uh, how can you be so silent? Um, uh, what do you think about uh, um, uh, concentration camps? Well, 68 generation, 68 you know, they generation. were protesting as well, Absolutely. because a lot of Nazis had been reintegrated into the establishment. Absolutely. Absolutely. You could, they could, uh, Germany could not be run. This is another great file in the National Archives, which is uh, connected, sort of, with uh, the file. I mean, it's in it, uh, Spender's file about I'm going to visit Germany, the secret, the secret file, is in with a mass of other papers, many of which are to do with denazification. Um, and the English were up against an impossible situation because every level of uh, responsible life was Nazified. Even the crowd boys were Nazified, you know. So you, you couldn't remove all of them without having a terrible problem of. Um, of what? I mean, there were no substitutes. Uh, there was nobody in Germany for 30, 30 years who had any exper experience of um, responsible um, uh, governments, uh, discipline, blah, 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 uh, except the Nazis. So they, they had to be some compromise. Also, Spend is very good on the fact that often the so called anti Nazis are sort of more indoctrinated than the, the Nazis, but once you start really trying to. Sort of yes, there's an interview with a communist. Um, right at the end of the book, um, uh, and a lot of people pretending to be anti Nazis whom Spender doesn't like, finally comes across to communist, and the communist says, uh, yes, I have been consistently, consistently anti-Nazi for the last 13 years. So then Spender says, well, uh, it's nice that you now believe in parliamentary democracy. How long has it been going on for? <laughs> um, and uh, the communist said, well, as soon as we establish the parliamentary Democracy will will start trying to destroy it. Basically, you know. Yeah. Can I ask you, did he ever have any um, interest in, in in politics? Because it strikes me that his work, his um, particularly his German work, is almost kind of a, a kind of a soft soft politics. Mm. You know, it's a almost a work of kind of um, diplomacy, really. Um, but. Well, he's uh, a writer, a poet, and the, 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 fir the first thing he wrote in Germany was the temple. Mm -hmm. It's a homosexual coming of age novel, if you want to look at it like that. And just two days ago, I came across a letter from um, Radcliffe Hall, mm -hmm. who wrote The Well of Loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a reply to an invitation by Spender to come and speak at the Oxford English Society. And mm -hmm. Radcliffe Hall says, you'll have to forgive me, but I've been having such a terrible uh, uh, well of loneliness with this first and possibly greatest lesbian novel 
of the 20th century. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, uh, Miss Radcliffe Hall um, was a lesbian, got into terrible trouble, and um, threatened with jail. There was a camp press campaign against it, and it completely ruined her life. Somebody in the what? Daily Express? Uh, somebody called Douglas in the Daily Express um, campaigned against her, and um, she really had a terrible time. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, Radcliffe Hall said, I'm um, uh, I can't come because I've had such a terrible time. The magistrates are planning to burn this book and send me to jail without reading it. <laughs> and I've been trying to uh, insist with my defense counsel that they at least read the book that they're prepared to condemn. Um, well, uh, the temple was supposed to, I think, supposed to be a continuation of the world of loneliness. And there's letters between Isherwood and Spender when um, Spender says, I think I'm going to have to give up my well of loneliness period. It's just simply too difficult. And Isherwood writes back saying, I'm so glad to hear that the well, you're um, skipping the well of loneliness phase. It didn't really suit you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've been trying to work out the various uh, um, consecutive versions of the temple, which is very difficult, but you can um, work it out. And at a certain point, he sent it to Cape, at an early point, in 1932 or something, long before uh, it was sent to other people. And it was seen by Edward Garnett, who was the father of David Garnett, Bloomsbury writer, author, very distinguished. Um, and Edward, who was the reader for Cape. And um, Edward Garnett wrote saying, um, I really do not think you should publish this book and end up with Mr. Douglas of the Daily Express. Um, starting a campaign against English homosexuals um, in a German environment with German lovers. Says, says. <laughs> so, uh, the earliest phase of his uh, experience of Germany was to do with freedom. It was to do with physical, the, the, with the wonderful thing of the Weimar Republic, of, uh, you know, like Kirchner's paintings, uh, uh, or a lot of new people by, by a river about to plonk in and then um, drive themselves off and stuff like that. Male women, male female, it wasn't really about homosexuality. It wasn't like issue of insisting Berlin means boys. It was to do with physical freedom. And I think that the temple it was an attempt to, to talk about physical freedom and not, and not so much um, homosexual coming, coming of age because the um, sexual identity is not a part of the book, really. It's not comic, in my view. Anyway, I'm trying to work this all out. Um, so it began as, but, as freedom. Yes, up to 1931. There is a in that, though, as well, isn't there? Well, there is in the version. He, he rewrote it in 1987. I mean, I think, it, I think a that there is a continuum here. You know, it's a, a, a similar, you know, kind of othering homosexuals, othering Germans. Oh, you could go to jail in all way. And you could go up until 1967, not that many people did. Can you turn an interview with the University College School magazine, which when students already in the study trying to write the young interviewer says, why do you go to and the students and says, sex. Well, you know, if you're interviewed, then you're in a certain mood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you and you've heard it many times before, you just want to shock the guy and go back to your cup yeah. of tea. I honestly don't think that people should be so... But I, I do think for all of them it began as sex and freedom and then they were sort of were forced to turn that into something political by the way that events yeah, occurred. Yeah, absolutely. I was going and to that, say. And September Journal is very good on that, that suddenly he's yeah. going and revisiting these temple experiences in the light of how Germany's changed. Exactly. Um, and, and trying to work out if he was at fault in not seeing that as a, in not seeing sort of physical exercise as a precursor of of more Nazi tendencies. Um, but I think we should continue this conversation with us away. Um, and thank our speakers very much and wish Matthew best of luck in trying to get this republished. Um, and thank you for coming.